Capitalism is going through its worst crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s, and our destruction of our national, natural environment shows no signs of abating. And these are two reasons why I think the topic chosen for today is particularly important, because the economic crisis and the ecological crisis that we are now experiencing, I think, create a unique watershed moment in history. Nothing like this has ever happened before in the history of the Earth or in the history of humanity. We need new ideas. And the theme is by collaborating with ideas of the past, we are able to create new ones. But in addition to this, the reason I was attracted to speaking to Ted today is because when I read what the students came up with, I felt as though I was speaking myself. Because I'm interested in the history of the liberal arts tradition, and this theme is an essential part of the original liberal arts ideal, which I think that we need to recapture today. So what I would like to do is talk to you about understanding what the liberal arts were at their point of origin in classical antiquity as a way of engaging in the liberal arts collaboration with the very theme of this program. The easiest way to understand what the liberal arts were is to see the word liberal arts as a direct transliteration of the Latin phrase artes liberales. And the person who used this phrase most extensively and for the first time is the great Roman statesman Marcus Tullius Cicero. The liberal arts were born not in a classroom but in the Roman forum. And they were born in a forum bloodied by the five civil wars that destroyed the Roman Republic. The liberal arts ideal which we inherit was Cicero's attempt to create an educational system which he thought would save the Republic. It was his direct response to the violence that destroyed the Republic. In fact, there are speeches of Cicero's in which he acts, talks about people having to sponge the blood off the pavement stones of the Forum after a night of political violence. So the liberal arts tradition itself is a result of a human response to violence that destroyed a republic. Cicero's ideal was based around the sense of the Roman who would save the republic would be an ideal statesman. And our sense of general education comes from this. Cicero says that the complete and perfect orator is he who is able to speak fully and in a varied style about all things. All things included Rome's past. This is going to be one of the key ideas I'd like to share with you today. Rome has always brought its past into its present. Anyone who's lived in Rome for a while knows what I'm talking about. Freud even used the city of Rome as an example of the human psyche, the way in which one memory is built on top of another memory. This was in particular important for the constitution of the Roman Republic. Cicero says one of the things the orator has to be able to speak about is this, not to know what happened before you were born is always to remain a child. For what is a human being's life if, through the memory of things past, it is not woven into the lives of those who came before? Think about this idea. The essence of a human being, from this Roman point of view, is to be woven into the lives of those who came before. This is a statue of a Roman patrician who's holding the busts of his ancestors. Now, he's not holding the bust of his ancestors to say, look what a great person I am because of what my ancestors did. The reason he's holding the bust of his ancestors is because his ancestors are reminding him what he has to do in order to serve the Republic. The Roman aristocracy had only one career path open to itself, to serve the Roman people. And in return, it was given honor and glory by the Roman people. And the way in which the Roman aristocracy in a republican form of government served the Roman people was by following what were considered to be the customs of the ancestors. We began with the people who founded Rome and continued through the, through the centuries of the Republic. And you can see a series of virtues which were exemplified ideally in the lives of the ancestors 
and which young people growing up in a noble home were expected to imitate in their lives and then pass it on to their own children. Look especially at the second virtue, constantia, because I'm going to come back to that, steadfastness. The Roman sense of self, typical of the ancient world, is of an extensive self. You find the meaning of your life by thinking of the whole of which you were part, as opposed to the modern sense of a self, of turning within and seeing yourself as a whole. The Roman extensive self was a self that was embedded in a continuity of generations across time. It kept the Republic together. Cicero quotes this line from a Roman poet, on ancient ways and ancient men stands the Roman state. The ancient ways and ancient men maintain peaceful competition among aristocrats for public office and honors because they had to obey the, virtue, the virtues of their ancestors. Violence destroyed the Roman Republic. The growth of the Roman Empire created tensions within the aristocracy which they were unable to contain and by the first century BC, the aristocrats, for really the first time in Roman history, had begun to use assassination and political violence on one another. It had to do with the growth of the, of, the, of the empire, armies being abroad for decades and having allegiance to their generals as opposed to the city of Rome. Violence took the original harmony of the Roman virtues and created chaos in the city. So violence destroyed the ancient customs and it destroyed the Republic. Cicero could have retreated into his studies, as some people did, but he didn't. Cicero believed that the Roman Republic could be brought back to life, and he asked himself, how could one renew this Roman sense of self, which is part of the whole history of the Republic, past, present, and future? How could he renew the civic self when the Romans destroyed their own tradition? Cicero turned to Greek philosophy and especially to the Greek sense of the order and harmony of the universe. Cicero took from Plato and Pythagoras the idea that what really is, is order, is harmony, and that by contemplating the motions and revolutions of the heavens, one could bring that order and harmony into oneself. Cicero thought that he could find in nature the moral virtues that had been lost in the Roman civil wars. And Cicero writes, God, the gods put souls in human bodies so that there would be those who would look after the earth and who, contemplating the order of the heavens, would imitate it in the measure and constancy of their lives. You see the word constantia? That ancient Roman virtue now appears in the heavens for Cicero. He's not negating Roman Republican virtues, but he's looking to astronomy, to the study of nature, as a way of finding in nature what the Romans destroyed in their republic. So what you have at the beginning of the liberal arts tradition, and Cicero's crafting the idea of an orator who could save the republic, are two forms of self-transcendence. The self-transcendence that comes by being yourself as, uh, seeing yourself as part of a continuity across time, and the self-transcendence that comes from seeing yourself as part of the entire cosmos. How could you combine them? In ancient Rome, unlike modern times when we say nothing is worthwhile unless it's new, in ancient Rome, nothing is worthwhile unless it's old. So what Cicero did was he turned Greek philosophers into Roman ancestors. And he said, we need to give to the Greek philosophers the same sense of veneration and respect that we gave to our ancestors. He took a traditional Roman custom and melded Greek philosophy into it and that's one of the things we inherit through the liberal arts tradition. So Cicero thought that he could save the Republic through an education which would create a statesman who was also a philosopher. And what I think is so rich about the liberal arts tradition is that you have both worlds together. You have the idea that your life has no meaning unless you serve the public. And yet at the same time, there's a sense that you can't serve the Republic unless you have the wisdom and virtue that comes from philosophical contemplation and feeling yourself as part of the greater whole. Just being a scholar, just being a philosopher is not enough. Being a statesman without wisdom and virtue will create a tyrant. That's Cicero's thinking. Cicero failed. The Republic fell. But Cicero's ideas continued across time 
and the Republic came to life again on the shores of, of the Potomac. And one of our founding fathers, one of the people who crafted America, John Adams, had Cicero as his personal model. And Adams gives a definition of Cicero, which for me is the briefest and yet m most useful explanation of what a liberal arts education should create. Adams, writing about Cicero, says, as all the ages of the world have not produced a greater statesman and philosopher united in the same character, his authority should have great weight. Now, we don't, today, if I say that the goal of education is to create a statesman and philosopher, some people might not know what we're talking about, but just last week, I heard some of my colleagues use the word citizen scholar, that the ideal Connecticut College graduate would be a citizen scholar. That is Cicero's ideal of the way to save the Roman Republic. You're not a scholar alone. That's not enough. You have to serve the common good. You have to serve the people. At the same time, you can't serve the people unless you have moments of contemplative leisure in your life. So that's the original liberal arts ideal. So what I've tried to explain to you so far is the liberal arts tradition as an inheritance, which fits in perfectly with the theme of TED. But I can't stop here. The Romans won't let me. The Romans had a sharp sense of the duties of inheritance. And from a Roman point of view, if Cicero and Seneca were here right now, or if I were the patrician holding the bust in my hand of Cicero and Seneca, they would tell me that I now have to speak of the liberal arts tradition as a mission. I have to ask myself, and we have to ask ourselves, as part of the liberal arts tradition, how do we fit in to this continuity across generations? It's stated very well in a beautiful letter like, uh, that Seneca wrote, which I can't quote in full because it would take too long, but if you focus on what I've underlined, you'll see the sense of obligation we have toward the past and toward collaborating with thinkers of the past. Seneca is very much thinking of the ancient Roman tradition of, of the ancestors, but he too has applied the idea of ancestors to philosophers, anyone who searches for wisdom. He said we need to venerate not only the discoveries of wisdom, but their discoverers. And we have to treat wisdom as an inheritance. What does it mean to treat wisdom as an inheritance? Think of land. Think that your father has left you land. Seneca says we have to increase what we have received, and then we have to pass that inheritance on to others. Ideally, we add to the wisdom we get from the ancients, but even if we can't add to the wisdom we get from the ancients, we can use it in a new way because our times are new. I don't have any new thoughts to add to the crisis of capitalism and the crisis of the environment, but I want to tell you one thing that I would like to pass on to you from my study of the liberal arts tradition. Of the two forms of transcendence, I want to talk about the idea of cosmos and what it means to feel yourself part of a whole. This is the Greek philosophical aspect of the original liberal arts tradition. The Greek word cosmos originally meant ornament could be applied to a piece of furniture, it could be applied to a shield. The Greeks did not have a word to describe the whole, all that is. Plato took the word cosmos and applied it to everything that is. And that was an act of faith on Plato's part, that what is, is order. And the word cosmos could be translated as the beauty created by order. Our word cosmetic, by the way, still retains some of that original Greek idea. Why is astronomy edifying? Because from the ancient point of view, when you look at the order and harmony of the heavens, you're seeing a beautiful symmetry. You're actually hearing the music of the heavenly spheres. This is an idea that begins from uh, Protagoras. And I have to tell you, when my, my son was a little boy beginning to study the saxophone, he said to me one day, Papa, we're reeds, and when we die, we go to heaven to join our instruments. He didn't get that from me, it came from him. But that's exactly the way the ancient Stoics thought about the soul of a wise man. The soul of a wise man is a musical instrument that has to be attuned to the rhythm and harmony of the universe. Cicero says, in those things which are perceived by sight, no other animal perceives beauty, attractiveness, and the congruence of the parts. So human beings, from Cicero's point of view, and this is something he gets from the Greeks, have this unique ability because of our reason to perceive beauty. No other animal does. We are called for beauty. And then Cicero says that 
Wisdom and virtue come from the experience of beauty because when we experience something beautiful, we become one with it. He talks about the man who's studying the order and harmony of the universe, and then he says, the mind recognizes its own self and feels itself united with the divine mind. Anyone who walks into the Pantheon for a brief second has that feeling of self-transcendence. Go to the Pantheon and you'll see what I mean in Rome. The most beautiful description of self-transcendence I know of in the modern world is written by a poet, America's greatest playwright, Eugene O'Neill, in Long Day's Journey Into Night, which is set in New London. Listen to what O'Neill says. When I was on the square head rigger, bound for Buenos Aires, full moon in the trades, the old hooker driving 14 knots. I lay on the bowsprit, facing astern, with the water foaming into spume under me, the mast with every sail white in the moonlight, towering high above me. I became drunk with the beauty and singing rhythm of it. And for a moment, I lost myself, actually lost my life. I was set free. I dissolved in the sea, became white sails and flying spray, became beauty and rhythm. I belonged without past or future, within peace and unity and wild joy, within something greater than my own life or the life of man, to life itself, <clears throat> to God, if you want to put it that way. Now, can we do it? Can we solve our economic problems? Can we solve our environmental problems? Evolution continues at a cultural, psychological, and spiritual level. And I think the study and experience of beauty can help the human species evolve in new ways and new directions. And this is brought uh, forth in a beautiful little book by the philosopher Elaine Scarry, titled On Beauty and Being Just. On Beauty and Being Just. The title says it already. Scarry says that distributive justice, relations between human beings, can be described as a symmetry of everyone's relation to each other. So beauty is symmetry. That's this Greek idea, the order and harmony of the universe that we still find in modern science and mathematics. Justice is symmetry. So beauty and justice are closely related. If you think of the, the movement of Western and in some ways even world history, as you go from antiquity to modernity, we go from a sense of an extensive self, the individual is part of a greater whole, to this modern intensive self, which we grow up with, the whole idea of individual competitive people, possessive individualism. I think if we're going to move into the future as a human species, we have to find a way of bringing back into our consciousness the sense of an extensive self, which we find at the very basis of our liberal arts tradition. The search for beautiful symmetries, which is an idea we get from the liberal arts tradition, creates community between human beings and nature, and between human beings themselves. I discovered several, years, several months ago something I'd never seen before. We already have discovered this at Connecticut College. Some call it beautiful, we call it a community. That's the message Sister has left us. We've already discovered it here. Thank you. <laughs>